Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Alexio Picco and the, I'm the managing director of the Circle Group and I welcome you to the Connecting EU Insights 2021 Spring Edition. We are in, the, in our third day of uh, operation, let's say, and this morning we had already uh, the, the first event dedicated to innovation in the rail uh, sector, specifically about optimization and digital twin enchanting operations. And now we move again to, to the, in a way, to, uh, to the sea, to the ports, and a bit also on logistics. And we have a very, a very nice um, event on auto automation and innovation for short sea shipping, uh, strictly also linked to uh, an EU funded project called MOSES. Uh, we have a very uh, high level, top level experts uh, uh, today. And I will immediately give the floor to Professor Venticos, that will be the uh, master of ceremony. Je let me just uh, say a few words about him and introduce him. Uh, professor Venticos is an associate professor in the Laboratory for Maritime Transport at the School of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering of the, of the National Technical University of Athens, in Greece. He also the head of the Maritime Risk Group Research Unit. His expertise includes work in the fields of maritime safety and risk analysis, resilience engineering, human factors, maritime sustainability, and environmental risk assessment. During his presence at the National Technical University in Athens, he has participated in, in and coordinated EU major funded projects, research projects, implementing innovative approaches, ensuring maritime safety and efficiency, and covering technical, human related, and environmental aspects. He has published significant parts of his work in peer-reviewed journals and has given over 110 presentations and lectures at various international scientific conferences and symposia with topics relevant to his expertise. So it is really my pleasure to give to Professor Venticos the floor to be the master of ceremony and to manage as a moderator uh, this uh, very, very nice event. And I thank you for uh, your participation. I, I remind you to stay online also this afternoon for the next uh, interview we have at uh, two o'clock with uh, the head of Port Process Solution uh, in the Port of Ampur, Fantian Zatsusong Dome. And thanks a lot. And uh, Professor Ventikos, the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you, Alexio. Thank you for the introduction. Hopefully you can see me and hear me now. So I would also like to welcome all to this um, uh, session. Uh, the, the session is uh, entitled Shaping the Future of European Sources Shipping, Autonomous and Automated Technologies. And at this point, I would like to thank on behalf of uh, all the panelists and of the Moses Project, um, uh, the Circle Group for the invitation in, on this very, very interesting event. So we have a very uh, nice session scheduled in front of us. Uh, what uh, we have, we will start with a talk from the regulatory uh, point of view from uh, CFIS Papagiorgiou from EMSA. The title is Automation in Short Sea Shipping from a Safety Perspective. Then we will go a little bit to the industry side, to the Port of Valencia with uh, Mercedes de Juan uh, Muñellero uh, on potential of short sea shipping in the Mediterranean Basin. And as Alexio said, then we will focus on three major EC funded uh, project. We will start with AutoShip with uh, Ornalf, um, Jan Rodseth from Sintef Ocean. Uh, AutoShip uh, on demonstrating autonomous ships in Europe. We will continue with Aegis with Odd Eric Merkit from uh, Sintef Ocean again. Aegis, the next generation short sea shipping logistics. And we will conclude this very interesting session uh, with myself um, uh, representing Moses. And the presentation, our talk is entitled Creating Opportunities for Sources Shipping and Small Ports Within the EU Container Supply Chain Moses Innovation. So as you can see, we have we try to uh, we try to uh, to make to draft an interesting um, an interesting uh, agenda on this uh, topic. So covering the same topic from various viewpoints and standpoints. Uh, so we will begin with the presentation uh, by CIFIS by CIFIS Papagiorgiou from um, EMSA. And um, let me just uh, introduce a little bit CIFIS uh, to all of you. Uh, CIFIS, after graduating from our school from the National Technical University of Athens back in 2008, 
past almost two years in Norway as an approval engineer at uh, the Norwegian Classification Society, BNV, before moving, uh, moving to Lisbon and EMSA about uh, 10 years ago in 2010. As part of the SIP safety unit, CIFIS has been involved in various regulatory issues such as damage stability and fire safety of passenger ships. And the last three, three and a five, three point five years, he has been closely monitoring the mass uh, file for EMSA, maritime autonomous surface ship file for EMSA. His work involves participating at IMO meetings on behalf of the Commission, following research projects, and as of 2020, he is also the coordinator of the mass uh, task force at EMSA. So, CIFIS, uh, you can share your uh, presentation. The floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. We are all very excited to hear what you will present us. Just please turn on your camera if you like. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor Vendikos, for the very nice, uh, very kind words. Um, indeed, uh, this uh, this has been a brief overview of. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not sure. You should go I in think... full screen. Let's go. Okay, okay, okay. There, it is, there it is. Thank there you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much again for the introduction and for the opportunity to be part of this very very interesting uh, uh, event today. I think. Uh, I'm, I'm highly honored to be among this uh, incredible experts in the field. Um, and from my side, I will also give EMSA's perspective, and in particular, with some focus on regulatory aspects of, of mass. So with that, I'll go right into, into the presentation. So I'll start by, by asking a, a simple let's say question why why do we want or why do we head towards autonomy or uh, increase automation um i don't know if any of you will will recognize this this document it, it, it is taken from an imo uh document possibly a, a good colleague from the dma will recognize it in any case um this document, which says that there is growing interest in various application of automation, is a document from 1964. Um, just as a reference, yeah, this is the the year, uh, the last time that the Olympic Games were held in Tokyo. So it, it's been quite quite some time uh, that that we are talking about automation, or that automation is is around in in shipping. Um, anyway, what what I'm trying to say with this is that. Automation, of course, is, is not new in, in, in shipping, but obviously technology and in particular uh, computing power has had a maybe trillion fold increase. And of course, this has brought a huge change in, in, in what is feasible and what is not. Um, in any case, and however we were talking about automation already um, back in the 60s, I think that in the maritime industry since then, and of course uh, before that, when regulating, I think we have always been uh, thinking that there is a human operator or, uh, well, the, the master practically physically present on board, on the bridge. And, and, and I think this is, this is really worth remembering when we, when we will talk about regulatory barriers, because this, this thinking, this mentality is, is deeply uh, engraved, let's say, in, in, in the whole framework. So why still, I haven't answered the question, uh, why do we strive for autonomy uh, or let's say increased automation? Um, I would argue that the short answer to this is to, to improve, uh, first of all, uh, safety and, and sustainability as well. And of course, there are uh, promises of financial benefits uh, through adoption of, of automation. Um, personally, I, I, I will not go too much into, into, these, in, into this discussion. And also, for example, a lot has been said on the potential benefit of removing the human element. Um, and, and this has also been discussed a lot in various forums that uh, talk about mass. Um, 
I have to admit that I, I believe that it is possible to to automate ship functions in a safe manner and then and have benefits for all three aspects that, that I mentioned here. But one of the issues that we have, I think, as, a, as an industry is that we, we have not proven this yet. And this is why for even the, the let's say, most advanced and, and well-funded concepts and projects that we have seen, um, there is, of course, um, a significant period of, of trials that has been, um, that is foreseen. So, again, um, are the, the various concepts, for example, safe enough? And, and how do we prove it? Um, I, I, again, the, I, I would say that the short answer is, well, we don't know that yet. Of course, we, we can predict and uh, we can foresee that there are benefits, but um, we, we simply don't know. But in any, in any case, um, a lot of really good people, and uh, some of them are here today, and stakeholders, administrations are, are working, are putting a lot of effort on, on this. So I think we will make steps into this direction in the near future. And just as a point, and I will come back to the short sea shipping case, um, it is also clear that for various reasons, for short sea shipping, it seems to be the, the most attractive case for concepts of increased automation. And with, with that in mind, I will go now into what we at EMSA have been working on um, these last uh, three years uh, in relation to, to mass. And first of all, I would like to, to mention the safe mass study. And uh, this was a, a study, uh, rather a, a desk study, I would say, on, on risks and regulatory issues of some specific cases of, of mass. Um, and, and whoever is interested can download this study on, uh, on EMSA's website. But of course, we, are, we have a, a task force working on, on, on autonomous ships, on, on mass, and uh, I think it is, we have a lot of good expertise and uh, the people are working on different issues. For example, there are, um, we are working on appropriate digital services for mass. There's a lot of work going on in, in EMSA uh, in providing digital services and, uh, and what the, the good colleagues are, are working on is how to introduce mass in, in such environments. Um, also, there, there is a lot of work uh, that, that is especially picking up now on remote control center competencies and uh, what kind of competencies is needed. There is a lot of expertise in MSA and STCW in the STCW convention in relation to, let's say, the training training of seafarers. Um, we are also currently starting working on cybersecurity issues, and of course, we are heavily involved in regulatory processes, um, both in a European and an IMO uh, level. So that there is a lot of activity going on. In any case, today I would like to focus a bit more on on the Arbat study, which is a study conducted by uh, its ongoing, and it, it is being conducted by DNV. And the the study is is practically Arbat stands for risk based assessment tool, and by tool I mean practically a, a software. Um, so automation for, for the automation, uh, which is supposed to risk assess whether the introduction of automation or autonomy is as safe or at least as safe as uh, conventional shipping. Um, the, the study itself is separated in three parts. As you can see here, we are now uh, finalizing the first part, which is developing the, the framework on which the, the tool will be based on. And in, in the next two years, so we foresee that the study will be concluded in 2023. Um, we will work on the tool itself in, in testing, uh, but we, we, we still have a, a long way to go until that. How, how, but how is the ARBIT connected to, to the current regulatory framework? Um, what we had in mind when, when we were planning the, the tool, the study, was mainly um, the EU operational guidelines on, on mass trials. 
and um, these guidelines were well were drafted for for the EU, but they also introduce some basic instructions on the risk assessment. And for the risk assessment of such new concepts, there is um, it, it is recommended to have two approval phases: one preliminary phase where uh, typically the concept or the, the CONOPS uh, is being submitted to the approval authority and um, and then after that is being discussed or approved then the second phase is the detailed design for uh, for the full approval of the concept so what we were aiming at with the RBAT is this first is to to standardize and facilitate this first part of the approval um, and what we had in mind uh, was to to have a sort of non-binary outcome and by that i mean that the tool should not just say yes this is approved or no this is not approved based on on some specific um, data some input data but that the tool guides um, both, let's say, applicants, so concept and system designers, but also the administration or the approval authority by providing a, a tool that is, is uh, transparent, that is uh, coherent and analytical in, in the way uh, it presents, let's say, the, the work that has been done. And if you are into risk analysis in general, you... you you know that we we normally talk about really heavy uh, documentation or Excel files that 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 have hundred hundreds of rows, and what we want to do here, of course, is to to standardize this process and 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 facilitate it by um, also making sure that nothing is is forgotten and that the risks are are taken into account. I will also give you a very brief overview of what, let's say, what we are discussing. As I said, we are still in the phase of um, creating the framework and, and the tool in general. So this is what we are currently discussing with, uh, with DNV. And typically, the tool is, is designed in a hierarchical manner where the objectives and functions are introduced. But what will be introduced by the applicant is, is information on, on what is automated and how it is automated. And the tool itself should be able to, to, to give, let's say, answers on, on how this system can fail, so the various failure modes, but also on whether this, let's say, what, what has been planned is safe enough. So some sort of comparison to the current um, safety level. Um, as I promised, I'm going back now into the into the short sea shipping case, and I will try to to merge these uh, these two thoughts. So I'll, I'll go a bit out of the um, automation world, and I will say that the the main priority areas for the European Commission on short sea shipping are these three that are listed here. Basically, um, we're aiming at administrative simplification, um, supporting the industry in picking up technologies on sustainability, and also integration, uh, let's say, of short sea shipping in, in full logistic chains. And the, the question is here, can mass be the answer to, to these uh, efforts? Um, if one would judge from the from the existing or the the projects that have been um, developed so far, I, one could argue that this seems to be the case. That at least for these um, let's say issues, mass can provide answers. So therefore, I think that the question could become more: uh, Is there a business case for this? And I'm pretty sure that Ernest would 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 also touch on this so i will not go further and um, i think autoship and all the projects today are doing a great job in in diving into into this subject and to conclude i would like to to bring up some some final remarks um so from our side uh emsa as you saw we we have a lot of different items that we are currently working on and 
we do foresee that we will continue working on these items, supporting EU member states and the European Commission. Um, as I also said, the ARBAD project, we, we do hope and we, we have the ambition to standardize the, these early stages of the approval processes on mass concepts, thereby facilitating these significantly. Um, this, I don't think this is really the third one. I don't really think it's a prediction. It's, a, it's already true. So uh, what we see is that short sea shipping is practically the first field of application of advanced automation. So um, again, don't quote me on what advanced automation is. What I have in mind at least is um, concepts where there is uh, where there might be that might be unmanned ships with a remote control center. And finally, to, to conclude, just to say that in any case, the, the, uh, regarding the reasons that we do automation, I think it is always good to remember that automation is a, is a means to, to an end, is a means to, to achieve safer and more sustainable ships, and it's not the end in itself. So, and with that, I will conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sifis. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting presentation. Thank you for explaining us the priorities of the Commission and how you see things. Um, okay, I, I can see. I can see through the just to make it a little bit more interactive. We can, you know, put to, uh, in front a couple of questions, and then we will proceed with the next presentation. Um, I can see a question uh, regarding risk assessment for this uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, ships. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? You have already explained through Airbat some things, but just, you know, a couple of words. Um, on top of that, um, we see that I, I see it at the QA something that um, refers to inland shipping, that there are already some, you know, uh, project for uh, centers, uh, remote control centers for barges. If you can also elaborate a little bit on that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the, the risk assessment, first of all, I would say that since we don't have a regulatory framework in place on, uh, on automation, this is typically resolved by, by following alternative means, and these alternative means always or almost always uh, introduce uh, a risk assessment. So I, I, I think that as long as we do not have um, a, a regulatory framework, and I do think that it will be very difficult to have a very specific and prescriptive regulatory framework on mass, um, we will be looking at, um, at risk assessments that will be taking place, yes. so. Um, this is at least uh, this is what what I have seen and in, uh, in talking to to people that are involved in the projects that that have gone a bit uh, that are a bit more advanced like the the Yara Birkeland or now uh, the the Asco or the uh, Milliampere. Yeah. So for several of these projects, this is this is what we have heard at least, and this is not from us being directly involved as EMSA. Um, Regarding the inland waterways, I I can say that uh, indeed yes we I'm, I'm generally not an expert on on inland waterways but of course uh, through mainly the AutoShip project uh, I have heard a bit more about uh, let's say what what is going on and I have participated in in some uh, conferences and have met some people that are working on this. However, um, and there is a lot of good progress done in inland waterways, so this is correct, um, and this is acknowledged. Still, I, I would argue that, for example, the the level of advance that we have seen already in, in Yara Birkeland in particular, it, it is not here there in inland waterways. Maybe the inland waterways will, will uh, overtake, let's say, short sea shipping, but this is difficult to say at the, at the moment. Um, thank you, thank you Sifi. Sifis, thank you very much. Um, I see now that we have received more uh, questions on the Q&A. Sifis, if you uh, are polite enough, just, you know, go through them and uh, try to uh, reply to them. 
I know that Ornal from uh, AutoShip has also replied the one about why selecting source shipping as a potential candidate for mass and uh, autonomy. Just um, if you may just go through and uh, answer the sure. questions uh, on your, uh, your part. Thank you very much, Sifis. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much for the interesting presentation. And we will uh, proceed with the next uh, presentation. The next presentation uh, comes from uh, Mercedes de Juan Muñoyero. I hope, Mercedes, that I am uh, pronouncing uh, your uh, name correctly. Uh, <laughs> she comes from um, uh, Valencia uh, Port Foundation, and uh, Valencia Port Foundation is actually a partner at the Moses Project. Uh, you will be talking about the potential of source shipping in the Mediterranean basin. And uh, just a very brief uh, introduction of Mercedes. She has been working in the maritime sector from uh, 2000 in positions related to global marine electronic solutions and connectivity, including satellite communications, shipbuilding, and fleet maintenance. She holds a master's degree in naval architecture and marine engineering and an MBA from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. She's also an expert in maritime shipping sector and IMO's work in addressing emissions from uh, ships. So, um, Mercedes, the floor uh, is yours for the next uh, for the next 15 minutes. Uh, please go ahead and share your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Benticos. Uh, I would like to, uh, first. I would like to thank um, Alexio and, uh, and you for inviting us uh, to take place of this uh, event. And also, I would like to thank. Sorry, I would like to thank uh, Elena for her support at uh, any time. My presentation is uh, mainly focused on providing several market insights and uh, several guidelines for implementing or for promoting uh, the use of the source shipping services. Uh, uh, Fundación Valencia Port is a research center. It's a research center associated to the Port of Valencia uh, that has been promoted by the Port Authority uh, with the aim of generating value for the port community, for the world uh, port community. In this sense, we are not working only for the for the Port Authority, but also for the world or community, for any company that uh, has any activity related to the port uh, operations, shipping agents, um, freight forwarders, uh, terminalists, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, we work in three separate areas, uh, promoting the innovation or keeping update uh, the, the port community in the most uh, innovative technologies. Uh, the second one is uh, for, for, ma for maintaining the competitiveness of the port is crucial. Uh, the training, uh, keeping uh, the, 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 the port workers uh, and the port community update. And uh, finally, the knowledge that we gathered in, uh, in the, in, in mainly uh, through our participation in a research project is capitalized to the, through uh, consultancy services. Well, uh, I'm going to provide an insight in the uh, a few years in the port, about the Port of Valencia, the Port of Valencia is one of the biggest ports in the Mediterranean, the biggest European port in the Mediterranean. Uh, in uh, 2020, we have slightly affected by the pandemic. And finally, we, fi we, we finished the year with similar numbers to, to the previous one. We have moved uh, more than 80 million of tons, uh, more close to 5.5 uh, tubes, million of tubes, and uh, more than 500,000 vehicles. The passengers is obviously the passenger traffic has uh, strongly affected, uh, which is normal due to, to the current situation. Import and export represent close of 50% of the, of the transport movements, or the movements of goods in the port. 
Uh, regarding the position of the board in the source shipping, uh, Spain is the third country in Europe which must move a good move in uh, source shipping services. And uh, all these uh, shipping services are gathered by three ports in Spain. Um, the ports of Barcelona, Valencia and Algeciras accounts for more or less uh, seven percent of the of the goods move in uh, source shipping services. Then we consider that uh, we are we are a successful case of um, of implementation of the source shipping services. And this uh, presentation aims to to provide uh, the the marketing size. Uh, and several guidelines uh, for, for implementing it, as I mentioned before. The evolution of the traffic in terms of total traffic and containers has been constantly growing. Just only the last year has been affected by the, by the pandemic, as I mentioned before. The main part of uh, all traffic, uh, no, um, well, uh, is uh, not the main part, but the most important area uh, that uh, all traffic uh, are uh, originates or uh, is uh, destined for is in the Mediterranean and Black Sea, which accounts for nearly three, uh, 30%. When we are talking about the advantages of the source shipping services, uh, everybody has in mind the environmental impact. But there are others that are also uh, relevant. Depending on the, on the distance cover, uh, uh, the source of services can uh, reach important savings in terms of time and money, as we will see later. Uh, it contributes as, as uh, the service uh, the, the, uh, contributes to reduce the logistic uh, costs. Uh, this means that increase the, competi the competitiveness of the final client uh, the, the, because the prices, the final, the final price uh, that reacts uh, to the, cost, uh, the, the final customer is influenced by the, by the logistic cost. It's obviously that it uh, has a less environmental impact, but also uh, the source of system services deal with uh, the main uh, road transport con constraints. Um, the, time, the time the driver is uh, stay at the, at the vessel is considering a resting time, which is very important uh, from the point of view of the, leg of the legislation. Contributes to increase the quality of the life of the, of the driver. It's quite obvious that the, the driver uh, is resting uh, at his cabin and has a pool of services as cafeteries, uh, restaurants, and so on. What is quite different of being driving alone in a road and uh, sleeping in, in the truck. Uh, the source of services are less influenced by the fuel prices, the increase of the, vol uh, the volatility of the fuel prices is less uh, dependent of the land transport infrastructures and uh, also contribute to avoid uh, the typical uh, problems caused by the, the road transport. Bottlenecks, uh, traffic congestions, um, traffic restrictions. Uh, sometimes uh, the tracks are not allowed to, uh, to be or in several or to to drive uh, during the weekends or in several areas for particular restrictions. Uh, contributes to, to reduce the penalties and the insecurity or the unsafe, uh, the, the, in general, the drivers uh, suffer. Uh, this is an exercise uh, of, uh, for providing uh, an overview of, of the savings, mainly of the savings, when you compare uh, the, the sources being service uh, by the same uh, distance covered by track. The first uh, example is uh, a boat moving from Madrid to Turin. Uh, and you can see here the cost, the different costs. 
which is uh, you have an important issue in, in the coast. In this case, as uh, the route is very short, uh, the impact in the time is not so big, but also it's necessary to consider the cost of the externalities. When we are talking about the, the cost of the externalities, we are talking about congestions, accidents, pollution, the effect of the climate change, the noise produced by trucks, uh, maintenance of infrastructures, maintenance of the vehicle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then, as you can see, here has an also an important impact. The second is moving uh, goods from Sevilla to to Civitavecchia or to Roma. Then, as you can see, the impact or in the cost is uh, very important, close to about fifty percent. Sorry, twenty five percent. The saving in time is no, not so big because uh, it, it is the impact in this case is uh, bigger when uh, the distance is bigger as well. But also the impact in the externalities is uh, close to 50%. Uh, I'm going to provide uh, an insight of what uh, the source of services represent in Europe and in particular in the Mediterranean. The source shipping services account for 60% of the total movement of wood in Europe. As you can see here, two countries, Italy and the Netherlands, accounts for 30% of the services, uh, the movements of wood in, uh, in Europe, followed by Spain that accounts for uh, 12%, and Germany that accounts for the, more than the 9%. Regarding the, 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 the transport or the, the, the goods uh, transport in the source shipping services, in the Mediterranean, the most important are the liquid goods, which accounts for more than uh, uh, 40%. And in general terms, goods, uh, liquid and rice accounts for 60%. Uh, well, uh, in the case of the containers and robo units, accounts for more than the 30%, which is an important part of the traffic as well. 40 ports in Europe uh, accounts for uh, 20% of the total traffic. If you look at uh, these ports, the half ports, the main half ports in Europe, Eight of them, Rotterdam, Anwer, Amsterdam, Valencia, Algeciras, Barcelona, etc., etc. Um, the, the impact of the, um, of the um, source shipping services is lower than uh, the DC, uh, DC shipping. But uh, when you look uh, at the small ports, uh, the impact of the source shipping services is higher. Uh, this part is a focus on how to implement the source shipping services. Uh, the, 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 the most important is having the view of the client or the customer or the or the or, or, or this kind of services. What it is looking or what we offer. Uh, to the client. What we offer is increased efficiency. And with what is the definition of efficiency? It's very simple, more and better for less money. This is what we are offering. And for offering this, we put the, the focus in increased flexibility, fastly adapted to the market situation, regulatory situation, and uh, any, any potential change that uh, occurs in the market. Better uh, infrastructures, um, modern infrastructures and well-connected and lower uh, direct and indirect costs. Then uh, this, is, uh, this concept is um, be summarizes at um, very good infrastructures, well-connected, increase the quality of the services, and um, a very good organization. We enter in, in there what we are offering. We are offering connect 51% of the Spanish 
GDP with uh, a huge market of 274 million of customers. And we connect this in an easy way uh, with the, um, the position of the port and uh, the connections, the connections the port that ha has with other uh, main ports in Europe, uh, combined with the uh, excellent road and rail connections. Regarding the quality, we overseen uh, the quality of the services provided, not just by the port, but also by the terminalists and the shipping companies. This example is a focus on the, on the ferries, because it's easy to see, but um, it's important to uh, reduce the environmental impact. The, the project that you will see later um, address this issue. Accelerate the loading and unloading ties. If you see here, um, well, the size of the entries to the vessel is very small, then uh, the speed could not be very fast. Uh, this um, decelerate or reduce the time for loading and unloading the, the vessel and reduce it, the damage. This is an example of uh, a system using for, for lashing the, the tracks and the, and the cars to the, the, the vessel. And uh, usually um, produce several damage in, in the tires of the, of the vehicles. The second one is introduce the simplicity in the management of the bookings and the poor access procedures. We are moving to a system in which just with the booking pass or just with the cargo declaration and so on, you are able to enter at the port and reach the terminal with to stop at any place. This is uh, one of the things that, that we offer, and uh, a system a complete system online, fully connected with all the, the actors, the mere actors in the board, for facilitating and uh, decreasing the administrative burdens, which is really very important for increasing the productivity of the board, the productivity of the terminals, and the productivity of the sourcing services. What a poor authority uh, can do for promoting the uh, First of all, facilitating preferential berthing and uh, unloading uh, just at the right. Enable uh, fast and safe movements in the case site. Promoting good inland connections, as um, I mentioned before, and reducing the port taxes. Uh, this is crucial. Uh, the Port Authority of Valencia has a mechanism for reducing the taxes in function of the number of cars, but also in function of the environmental impact of the services provided. It is uh, the Port Authority offer a discount uh, in the port taxes of 50% with the condition of investing 35% of this, of this discount in reducing the environmental impact. At this environmental impact is measured in terms of uh, CO2 reduction or um, sulfur reduction and, and um, NOx uh, reduction and so on. Uh, but supported by measures, not supported by a certification that someone provides or something like this. It's also very important uh, to coordinate the relations with other administration and ports for facilitating all the service that we provide to, to the client, to the customers, to our customers, control the quality of the services and facilitate the business. We are uh, going to enter in depth in these three points in three cases uh, of how to promote in an easy way the relations with uh, other administration and ports, increase the quality and so on. For doing this, uh, we believe, as I mentioned at the beginning, that the training, uh, the, the, the port community is crucial for providing better services 
and for increase the cooperation and fluent, the fluent cooperation with the with the port, with the with the internal port community, with other ports uh, and other uh, administrations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have a very strong cooperation with the Port Training Institute. We give um, several courses uh, in which attend the main ports uh, in the Mediterranean, in the North Africa countries. We have a permanent uh, programs for uh, training people in the Mediterranean. The Jet Med Pro, uh, project is uh, a good example of, for promoting the young employment in, in ports in the Mediterranean. And also it's very important um, the, the, the work in the field that we are uh, doing in the framework of the Med Ports uh, Association. It's uh, also for facilitating uh, the, 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 the business uh, among other uh, actions, we provide uh, several market research on sourcing shipping. In particular, Fundación Valencia Por uh, Manas uh, Linepor. Linepor is a database of all the source shipping services uh, that, that are in Spain. In this database, born in 2004 as a tool for supporting the implementation of the European policies in terms of source shipping services. Um, initially, this tool uh, tries to, to, to fill the gap uh, in uh, regarding the, the, the data, the statistics uh, about uh, the skin of traffic and so on but uh, has evolutioned for providing uh, market information to the mainly to the to the, um, the shipping companies we provide information about how many companies shipping companies are operating uh, the traffic the source shipping services how many trips per week uh, are making every every company how to connect uh, uh, with information about to connect how Spanish port with other uh, ports in the, in the world, in Europe and in the, in the rest of the world, etc., etc. And uh, we also provide information about the, the global economic environment uh, in, at every time. Uh, the main, this, uh, this is a report that we made in collaboration with the um, the University of Valencia that uh, gives an insight in the in the global uh, economy situation. The well, the focus on the opportunities uh, that we have and the potential risks associated mainly associated to the, to the, the, the economical situation. And we have developed uh, also the first uh, containerized freight index in the Mediterranean. With all this information, the shipping companies, because the, is, is the most important client the, the port has, if the vessel doesn't arrive the port, the rest of the logistic check is, uh, is stopped or not make sense, then with this information, we provide uh, relevant uh, information for selecting the Port of Valencia as a key partner for providing opportunities of business, opportunities for uh, the, the companies that uh, are interested in uh, import or export. Several times we have made specific uh, studies uh, for, uh, for instance, the wine sector, looking for the opportunities for uh, export uh, uh, the products to the rest of the euro. As we mentioned before, we are offering a market of 207 million of customers, which is very important. And we have also collaborated with the uh, relevant shipping uh, companies in making uh, feasible analysis for implementing uh, new services, new lines, or also uh, implementing measures for reducing the environmental impact. 
uh, such as new fuel services. And this is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mercedes. It was a um, comprehensive, very comprehensive um, presentation. You, you know, you presented very uh, nicely the situation about uh, source shipping and especially within the Mediterranean basin. Um, I would say there is a question for you and for Spanish authorities uh, regarding autonomous vessels. Uh, if you can type your uh, answer on the chat, it would be fine, Mercedes. Thank you very much. So we can okay. close this question as well. There's another question uh, about connectivity, but I'm certain that the next speaker, uh, Ornalf, um, from uh, exactly from uh, the project of AutoShip uh, will uh, reply and will cover this issue as well. So um, before passing the floor to Ornalf, let me just uh, introduce him very briefly. Uh, Mr. Ornalf, uh, Jan Rodseth, I'm sorry if I'm doing something <laughs> about the pronunciation, uh, Ornalf, uh, has an MSc in cybernetics and electronic engineering from 1983. He's a well-known researcher for more than 25 years in the maritime information communication technologies. In the last 10 years, he has worked mainly with autonomous ship technology and maritime digitalization. He is a senior scientist at Sintef uh, Ocean, Norway, and is a general manager in Norwegian Forum for Autonomous Ships. He is a member of ISO, of ISO TC8 and IEC TC80, and regularly meet at IMO as observer for exactly ISO. Ornolf, the floor uh, is yours. Uh, you can share your uh, presentation. And for the next uh, 15 minutes, we are very eager to hear what you have for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nichols. Let's see if we can make this work. There. The wrong presentation. We are up and running, Ornald. Yes, but I, I took. Yeah, okay. Um, first, uh, I should say that um, for those who know, don't know Sintef Ocean, we, uh, we are now um, a part of the Sintef uh, group, uh, non profit. Uh, independent research organization, mainly Norway, about 2,000 employees, 350 of us in Sintif Ocean, which also uh, includes what used to be called the Marine Tech, for those who have some historical links to us. So uh, first, I thought I should say something about uh, why autonomous ships. Um, and, and also, as uh, Cephas uh, said, this is more or less uh, something that is happening. If you if you look at the number of crews on the ships uh, declining from the sailing days to today, with uh, yeah, less than 20 people on the big ships, it, it's really a, a function of automation all the way. And autonomy is, in a sense, uh, the natural um, continuation of this trend. And, and normally what we want to do is um, to automate uh, where it's uh, dull, dirty or dangerous. And uh, you, you could say that uh, the sailing uh, for long distances at slow speed could be quite dull. Uh, it can be dirty, particularly with some types of cargo handling, and it can also be dangerous. Most of the occupational hazards is um, on your own ship, but uh, accidents happen as we recently saw in the North Sea with um, Emslift uh, uh, incident. Uh, as has also been mentioned, the issue of moving cargo from road to waterways is also very important, particularly for inland uh, shipping, which was mentioned, and uh, also for short sea. And uh, there is also issues uh, related to um, various types of um, yeah, disturbances from the truck, uh, including particulate matter, dust from uh, from uh, asphalt and so on, noise, and a lot of other things. So basically, it, it's, a, it's a good argument for moving more cargo to sea. And also, it's important to recognize that shipping is basically the, the, the lifeblood of the world. It's about 90% of international trade is by ship, and this includes food, raw materials, oil, 
and a lot of essential uh, essential goods. And it's also a big part of the European transport. Uh, about 90 percent, I think, of the liquid fuel to EU is uh, transported by ship. And it's also an extremely sustainable type of transport with a significant lower uh, uh, greenhouse gas impact than uh, other modes, most other modes. But we still need to meet the climate uh, ch challenges and find um, a way to decarbonize uh, shipping, which is a major problem, which we are looking at in other projects. Um, cost of energy, for instance, will be up to uh, six times higher than for um, uh, traditional uh, fuel oil. Volume of energy is also a big problem. It takes a lot of space to, to, uh, to store some of these new fuels. But this is one of the reasons why we look at uh, autonomous uh, ships, because they provide the new opportunities. Uh, if you can remove the accommodation, you can make uh, small, you can make uh, more space for cargo. Accommodation, particularly on uh, small ships, um, use a lot of energy, and you can design ships totally different. And these are also some of the reasons why we are looking at short sea, because short sea ships tend to be quite small. And both um, crew cost and uh, the size of accommodation, the relative size of accommodation is quite uh, big uh, relate, uh, in relationship to the cargo. Uh, and this is also uh, basically the, the background for, for the projects that are running today, OSCO and the Yara Bay Club, which are the two commercial projects. Uh, that they are introducing new types of transport system, replacing trucks in both cases. And inland waterways was also mentioned as um, as possibility of um, of introducing smaller and more flexible transport uh, facilities in the maritime uh, trade. But still, in most cases, this will be uh, uh, overseen in some form by a short uh, control center. We are not necessarily looking at fully autonomous. Uh, ships. So why auto ship? Uh, as has been mentioned, it's not trivial to make an unmanned ship. Uh, you have to have new types of sensor systems, new types of navigation and maneuvering uh, decisions. There is a big safety uh, question, at least, uh, which requires uh, quite extensive risk assessments and so on. You have to solve the problem of, uh, of uh, maintaining the ship when you don't have crew on board. Uh, you cannot use heavy fuel oil, you have to go to other types of fuel and so on and so forth. Uh, there will be some costs associated with the shore control, uh, repairs and whatever. You need uh, automated, more than automated shore infrastructure. And it will be a long time in the, until international legislation is in place. And, and the last point is also one of the reasons why we are looking at short sea shipping uh, first, because it involves um, only one or two or three uh, governments that have to give uh, their permit to operate uh, with exceptions from uh, national law. If you have to wait for your IMO, it will take a very long time. So basically, there's a lot of risks and uncertainties in, um, in this area. And there are developments, and we have already several commercial projects on the way, but it's going not very fast. And I claim that one of the reasons why this is uh, the case is that uh, the investment, there's too much risk uh, associated with the investment. And, and this is also one of the reasons why we are seeing these smaller ships. It, it's a much lower investment uh, buying this OSCO ship than, for instance, trying to automate a big container vessel. Uh, and this is also why we launched uh, the Autoship uh, project, to try to show that these risks are much uh, smaller than um, uh, most people think. So one of the parts of Autoship is, uh, is to develop uh, what we call uh, seven key enabling technologies up to at least uh, TRL7 and show that this really works and that it can be approved for use in uh, the selected use cases. Uh, I, I won't go into detail. You, you can uh, look at the web pages, and uh, there is a brief overview here, here. But it's basically um, what you could call an artificial captain with the maneuvering remote control and all this stuff, and also an artificial chief engineer taking care of the uh, technical operation and uh, the, the um, uh, maintenance management. So, so this is one important part in authorship. 
which is uh, currently underway, and um, we are putting quite a lot of resources into this. But the other part, which is, uh, um, I would say, essential in the project, is to demonstrate this new technology and also the approval of uh, the technology for use in real uh, cases in two uh, uh, use cases. Uh, one of them is, in fact, an inland waterways uh, case uh, to, together with Blue Line Logistics in Belgium, operating um, in uh, near the Schelde and in the small uh, canals there. Uh, the other case is a short sea shipping route. It's a fish feed carrier. In this case, it's um, today operating in Norway, but this ship will also take a trip to Denmark and uh, address all the regulatory challenges that we have to solve to operate autonomously in uh, Danish waters. Uh, this is a more typical um, uh, short sea bulker, basically. The fish feed is uh, what it carries, but it could be anything, basically. And um, the, the point, of course, in the project is to uh, prove that the concept works by having all the technical systems tested, risk analysis and approval, uh, having the concept of operation and all the, the regulatory hurdles for the operation in the proposed use cases, and getting the national approval for uh, operations in Norway, Denmark and Belgium in this case, and also doing the cost benefit analysis, showing that this is in fact uh, a viable for, a way forward for uh, creating new types uh, of transport systems in short sea and in uh, shipping. So this is basically what we are doing in AutoShip. Um, it has a total budget of about uh, 30 million uh, euros. Uh, it's a quite high uh, level of funding. And uh, the reason for that is that we also include this uh, real life demonstrations, which are quite expensive. It will run uh, until uh, about the end 23. So we are uh, around halfway uh, now. And you can follow us on our um, web pages. And you can also find more information on um, the Norwegian Forum for Automobile Ships and the National Network of Automobile Ships uh, web pages. So thank you. Superb, Orf Ornolf. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for uh, giving us a flavor of what you're doing at. Um, uh, the AutoShip uh, project. I would say if you can go through the Q&A, there are a couple of interesting questions. So if you can reply to them so we can continue with the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Arnulf. Thank you. Uh, the, the next uh, presentation uh, comes uh, from, um, uh, will come from Eric Morkrid, uh, again from Synthet Ocean, and he will present the AGIS uh, project. Uh, let me just introduce very, very briefly Oderic. He graduated from uh, the, with an MSc in, on engineering cyber, cybernetics, uh, vessel control and navigation from uh, NTNU Trondheim back in 2008. He has worked as project engineer and project manager in marine cybernetics from 8 to 2014 with uh, hardware in the loop. These are very interesting terms. Uh, testing of control systems in offshore and maritime industry. And um, also he has uh, worked as project manager in the NVGL from 2014 to 2020. Uh, again, both with uh, hardware in the loop projects and innovation projects. Currently he's working as senior project manager with autonomy logistics in the maritime segment as part of the uh, of Ocean and the group uh, Maritime ICT and the Cybernetics where he's now, uh, he's currently coordinating AEs but also working with other projects like the Norwegian pro project SFI Autoship. Oderic, the floor is yours for the next uh, 15 minutes. We are very interested to see what you're doing at AEs. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Nikos, and uh, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, I will see if I am able to share the screen uh, in the right way. Uh, let me see here. Is this the correct view you see now? Uh, 
Oh, Derek, I think we are looking at we are looking your presentation in um, in in uh, with the notes. So now I think we are now. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's a it's a fifty fifty percent chance to to make it correct. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so I guess um, the title for, for today, I, I put uh, next generation short sea shipping logistics, but we are also looking into uh, inland waterways. So I just wanted to, to say that, but I will focus on the short sea uh, in this presentation. Uh, so um, first, um, the the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we are focusing on um, on four of them: uh, renewable energy, innovation, and infrastructure, sustainable cities and, and communities, and and finally, uh, climate action. And um, I will I will just say first briefly the background of the the project and then go into um, what I define as the the next generation logistics system and present our use cases uh, and then um, end with uh, some uh, some uh, more information of the project. So. Um, you all know about the, the EU ambitions and you have all seen this picture. Actually, it's the same picture as Ernulf uh, showed just recently. Uh, we want to move from road to, to sea and uh, with 30% by 2030 and 50% by, uh, by 2050. So having that in mind, uh, I'm heading over to what I like to call the, the logistical challenge. Because what we have today is uh, this simple picture. You can have a truck going from A to Z uh, and, uh, and back from C to A. And we are now trying to move to ships. And obviously they cannot go from A to Z. Uh, they can go from one terminal to another one. So we will have to uh, look at the hinterland as well here. And in the end, we'll probably need trucks for the last mile automation. And the question then is, how can we make the, the part down here competitive with, uh, with the trucks and, and road transport? And, and then we need uh, advanced, efficient and green intermodal systems, which is uh, what AEGIS stands for. So then um, the, the next generation sustainable waterborne logistics system, uh, how, uh, how will that uh, look like and what will we do? Uh, we will, first we will redesign the logistics system, meaning that we will develop a new user-centered logistics system based on autonomous components, uh, some part of autonomy at least, uh, with better services quality uh, and lower impact on environment and society. And in that goes uh, introducing more diverse sizes of ships because we see that big container ships, they, they cannot um, compete in, in the short sea segment. But if you look at um, covering small ports uh, in, for example, fjords and, and the canals, uh, we introduce what we call mother-daughter solutions. Um, that is when, uh, if you look at uh, the container ship as a mother, you can have small autonomous uh, vessels that serve as daughters for, for the mother. I will come back to that in, in one of the use cases. Uh, we will need more flexible ship systems, meaning that you can uh, maybe you need some kind of multi-purpose ship that can handle uh, different types of cargo or we need different types of uh, cargo handling equipment. There must be more automation in the cargo handling, uh, both on board the ships and also at the, the terminals. Um, and one way of enabling more automation is to standardize the cargo units and our main focus in I guess will be on uh, containers because they are easily connected to other transport modes as uh, trucks and, and railway. Uh, one other important factor here is digital connectivity and um, uh, international uh, ship traffic uh, 
and local port logistics are hindered by um, the lack of digitalization and uh, a lot of uh, paperwork and uh, different systems where we report. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to, to gather everything into to one common way of um, communicating between the stakeholders and, uh, and uh, connect ship systems to, for example, terminator operators terminal operator systems. Uh, within digital connectivity goes also cyber security uh, and, uh, and the resilience of the, the communication. So uh, then to, to the most interesting part, the, the use cases, uh, I will spend most time on short sea shipping use case, but then we have two more on inland shipping and, uh, and where, one where we um, look at the ports side of this uh, logistics system. So use case, the, um, the short sea use case is based on a, uh, on a Norwegian case and it's led by a North Sea container line who has uh, container ships going from Rotterdam to the coast of Norway, visiting a lot of terminals all the way up to Troms uh, far, far north. And um, uh, we will zoom in a bit to, to the Trondheim uh, fjord. And uh, the, the red line here is showing the fairway of this container ship. And today it goes uh, into Orkanger uh, just uh, inside the fjord here. But if we want to uh, enable uh, the short sea or the waterborne transport in the fjord, we will need to uh, have uh, smaller vessels visiting these small uh, ports that are denoted with blue dots here. And these small ships could be uh, like uh, the the upper one here has maybe three or four TUs. Um, the second one is maybe about 50 TUs. We, we don't know yet. It's uh, analysis uh, we are uh, doing to, to find out uh, the potential there. Uh, another thing is that these uh, small vessels here, they will need to be autonomous and have uh, automated cargo handling systems if this is going to be uh, viable. Um, the next use case is um, based on uh, on the canals and the inland waterways in Belgium and Netherlands, and it's led by DFDS, who today is uh, having a lot of uh, trucks um, in uh, in the Rotterdam area. Especially, there's a lot of uh, congestion, as you know, and 55 percent of the truck hours uh, is uh, in. Uh, queuing or in congested areas. Uh, so there is a huge potential in moving this to barges and, and preferably row row barges. And you have seen these pictures before today. Um, this uh, one is from Sulu Associates, the, the pallet barge, and, and it's the uh, row row uh, Asko barge uh, down in the right corner. Uh, so we will um, come up with the uh, row row barge concepts that uh, can compete with trucks and they will need to be fully autonomous uh, cost wise if this is going to to uh, work uh, then um, the next uh, case is um, is called revitalizing regional ports and city center terminals and we have uh, Port of Aalborg and Port of Vordingborg, who are both partners in the project. And um, we will, in this case, increase efficiency to the value chain and, and increase competitiveness uh, towards road transport in small and medium ports and use these ports as test sites for the application of technical developments in Aegis. Uh, that goes for um, new terminal concepts. We have uh, MacGregor and, and CargoTech in, in the team as well, and we're looking at uh, and how we can automize the, the terminal operations and, uh, from from the ship to to the terminal and from the terminal uh, out to the hinterland and the, 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 the trucks and uh, for uh, as, especially for Port of Aalborg, uh, look at how we can connect this to to the railway uh, as well. Then I wanted to include just one specific example on uh, 
some of the work we are doing in Aegis these days. And, and this picture uh, shows uh, the top here, the, the Terminator operating system from Grig Connect, who is also a partner in the project. Uh, there is an illustration from uh, McGregor here uh, showing a uh, uh, robotic container handling system in a, in a terminal with the ship here. Uh, and the last picture is, uh, is showing a 3D mapping of the uh, terminal area. And, and the idea here is uh, if you, you can imagine a vessel calling a smaller port at night, uh, when usually the small ports are closed, then an autonomous crane can discharge, let's say five to 10 containers. Um, there will be no need for a crane operator or port operators, uh, and there will be no need for interaction with, uh, with the terminal operators. And you can operate 24 seven. Uh, if you have digitalized uh, all the cargo equipment and the bollards and things that you you need for the the autonomous systems to act together because the the, the autonomous ship will will need to know exactly where to dock and the autonomous cranes will uh, will also need to know the exact locations at the terminal area where to put the containers and where to to put it on the on the ship so um uh, Greek connect has done a, a lot of this in some Norwegian terminals where they have uh, had uh, some mobile mapping and using uh, some drones and to um, so together with uh, McGregor and CargoTech uh, we are doing some very interesting work in this project. Uh, I also need to mention a couple of other things we do in the transition towards the next generation short sea shipping in the EU. We also have to include something about policies and regulations. And as Ernulf said in his presentation, we also do cost benefit analysis in Aegis. Um, so when it comes to policy support and measures, we just, just say a few words. We, we will investigate um, whether do existing legal requirements applicable to short sea shipping fit the policies that are calling for a transition from land-based to automated maritime transport logistics. And we also need to find what are the regulatory and policy hurdles that are encountered by stakeholders today. And then after that, propose some implementation measures for policy instruments. Uh, one example here uh, could be the European Maritime Single Window Environment Regulation. Uh, then to the cost benefit analysis, um, they will be based on KPIs. And uh, I will just mention the KPI groups we are looking at. We have the, the economics, uh, which speaks for itself uh, usually. Um, they have the environmental uh, KPIs and go also for a greenhouse, a greenhouse gases, pollution, um, biodiversity, etc., and also the social KPIs on, on safety and security, employment and labor conditions, um, etc. All of these summed up should give us a sustainable maritime transport system. And then I would just like to, to finish off with um, showing you uh, the partners and the funding for the project. And uh, from, from Norway, we are Sintef, Grid Connect, uh, NCL, that is North Sea Container Line, and uh, the Port of Trondheim. From Finland, we have McGregor and CargoTech. Uh, from uh, Denmark, I've already mentioned DFDS, Port of Aalborg, and Port of Wordingborg. Uh, in addition, we have the universities, Aalborg University and the Technical University of Denmark. And the final partner is uh, the German ISE, uh, which stands for Institut für Strukturleichtbau und Energieeffizienz, if I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. Um, sorry, I clicked a bit fast there, but um, 
anyhow, more information of, of the project can be found on our webpage or as Ernolf also said on the NFAS and uh, INAS pages. Thank you. That's uh, it from my side, uh, Nikos. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for uh, sharing all this information with us. Um, I think that uh, Aegis and Moses can have many synergies <laughs> because uh, we, I, I believe that we are looking at the same problem from different perspectives and I hopefully we will continue our cooperation towards this uh, end. Um, there is a question of the Eric uh, on, on uh, the Q&A. Ornolf is uh, replying right now, but if you would like also to give your perspective, it would be more than fine. Thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we will continue, we have uh, left 10 minutes, so I will try to go very fast um, with uh, the presentation uh, from, um, from our side. Um, let me see how I will share my presentation. Uh, share the presentation. Share. Uh, hopefully, I, uh, you can see our yes, presentation yes, as well. Yes, Dr. Ventikos, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, so, uh, I will, as I said, I, I, we have like eight minutes, so we will try to go uh, very fast. Um, uh, the title is Creating Opportunities for Sources Shipping and Small Ports. Please note the small ports within the EU container supply chain, and we will discuss about some of the Moses innovations. Uh, Sources Shipping in the EU, already the previous, um, uh, the previous speakers covered that. There is an aim at transferring cargo from blood-based transportation to more environmental friendly modes and uh, to increase the share of sourcing shipping in this effort and in the container supply chain, we need feeder routes to reach more destination ports and feeder vessels um, to be able to carry uh, more or less cargo in a cost efficient uh, way. So what uh, we are looking, we are looking for solutions, um, sourcing shipping to small ports with no cargo handling infrastructure could provide an alternative to land-based transshipment we are searching for efficient solutions, green and safe uh, solutions. So uh, the, this potential is mostly untapped because existing feeders cannot be served by small ports. And there is a small or little incentive for carriers to choose maritime transport instead. Many times this happens uh, over a road or rail modes. Now, uh, the Moses, the, the project runs up to 2023. Uh, end of June. Uh, the title is Automated Vessels and Supply Chain Optimization for Sustainable Sources Shipping. You can see uh, the budget of the projects around 8 million and uh, the consortium, it's a multidisciplinary consortium. Uh, we have um, partners from Greece, Cyprus, Italy, Circle, who uh, is the organization that kindly invited us here, a standard uh, from uh, Spain and, and Valencia, um, we have uh, partners from uh, the, the Netherlands, from uh, Denmark, and from Sweden. The aim of the Moses project is to enhance the sources shipping uh, component of the European supply chain by addressing the vulnerabilities and strains related to the operation of large containers. So it, let's say it's like a twofold strategy here. Uh, about sources shipping feeder services. Uh, we want uh, a logistic solutions for balance in demand and supply and for the deep uh, sea, uh, ports uh, efficiency. Uh, we are looking for technological solutions for improving this kind of uh, ports and the efficiencies of these ports, reduce, for example, birthing time, proof safety and this kind of um, advantages. So uh, what uh, we are looking here and what we are looking in Moses, it's to create new pathways in the EU by integrating small ports with no infrastructure at all into the overall EU container supply chain. So, for example, we can have um, containers from large container terminals, as, the, as you can see on the picture on the left hand side of, um, of this um, slide to small ports through dedicated sources shipping uh, feeders. The, the, you can see that uh, in this small port, there is no infrastructure at all 
to um, uh, handle to deal with containers. Now um, we have this a, a slide on uh, with one with just one question: What are the key components of the next generation of source shipping in the EU? So any of the attendees who wants to you know to answer to that. Uh, uh, question, please uh, use this QR code to do so. Thank you very much. Now, the, the, the concept of the Moses, uh, very, very quickly, we have the mother vessel going into the big port. We have a swarm of autonomous tags that they are controlled by an, a remote control center at the port mainly, um, that they control the entrance and the maneuvering of this big mother vessel. And uh, at the same uh, side, we have an automobile system that it's be, it's co it cooperates with the autonomous uh, tugboat swarm, comprising what we call the Moses autodoc system. Uh, then uh, we have the uh, Moses feeder vessel with their co robotic container handling system mounted on board this, uh, this um, uh, feeder vessel. The feeder vessel uh, then goes through uh, the feeder uh, line to a small port where it can self uh, unload the, the containers for the specific uh, port. At the same time, there is, a, as we can understand, this um, a, or part of this strip of the feeder vessel can be done in an autonomous manner. So there is, a, a, let's say, a shore uh, control station and for the feeder vessel. And there is also a Moses uh, recharging station in the case or in case that we have a, an electric feeder vessel. Uh, on top of that, we have a matchmaking platform, which as we see can uh, support um, the uh, logistics uh, of uh, the containers. So if we focus on the Moses innovations that they are you know, close, closer to short sea shipping, we are talking about an autonomous feeder uh, you can see here uh, some very, uh, let's say, uh, basic points like uh, enhanced maneuverability and position keeping capability, enabling the operation in uh, unprotected service ports, or loading and unloading capability independent from the port's infrastructure. And at this mo moment, at the Moses, we are dealing with specific technical and other specifications. So we would like to have a reduced um, uh, ballasting and deballasting operations. We are also having. Um, uh, the robotic container handling system, which will be mounted on the feeder vessel. It will be autonomous uh, operated, and uh, there will be an intelligent operation support system that provides situation awareness to the remote operator. So there will be a remote operator somewhere. Uh, so dynamic, for example, there will be a dynamic task allocation to the operations at the uh, uh, shore control station. Um, then, as I mentioned, we have the Moses innovation uh, with the matchmaking platform. This will be a horizontal collabor collaborative and collaboration logistics platform, which allows shippers to submit their transport needs, so the demand. And on the other hand side, we will have the transport operation in shipping lines. We will be able to advertise their scheduled prices for the social shipping routes supply. And this will be a coupled, and this will be focusing, as we understand, to our um, uh, innovative feeder uh, vessel. So uh, there will be an order aggregation at container level according to capacity, availability, user-defined criteria, legal and, and, poly and uh, practical constraints in order to have a nice way to balance uh, things. Now, uh, about the innovative feeder vessel, uh, we are looking on safety issues. Uh, we are looking on the environment and, of course, at efficiency uh, aspects. So we will have this, the whole portfolio there for this uh, innovation. Uh, the same happens with uh, the robotic container handling system. Uh, we want, for example, to minimize risk in cargo handling and uh, to increase uh, the efficiency in various aspects, like, for, uh, like, for example, enable low, low container uh, services to small ports that have limited or no loading and offloading infrastructure or impact on the receiving port logistic infrastructure and port control organization. The matchmaking platform focuses mainly on the environment and efficiency, the environment in, in, in the sense that the shipper might be informed about transport services with low environmental footprint and is able to select them 
leading to the reduction of the auto total emissions uh, for the car and transportation and with efficiency, for example, single communication channel between shipper and carriers. Everything though will be more or less coupled and focused on our uh, own uh, vessel or our own uh, feeder vessel. Now, um, we, have, uh, we, we, we will have uh, pilots uh, for the tugboats, uh, for the cargo uh, container handling uh, system, for uh, the vessel in terms of uh, the model testing, mm -hmm. and for, um, uh, we also, we will have some uh, business cases. Here we have two of them, the Western Med uh, Spain uh, business case, here we have started to, let's say, to identify specific features, three weekly services per year, per, uh, per week. This is um, between the Valencia port, Sagunto port, and Gandia port. And you can see about the vessel of uh, the size of the vessel that we are talking about. And uh, a second uh, business case comes from Eastern Mediterranean on the Greek uh, archipelagos where you, you can see uh, a, a, a route uh, with, from, in, or at various um, ports uh, at the Greek archipelagos. Uh, Pireus, Pireus, the port of Piraeus is a partner of uh, our project as well as the port of Mykonos. And here you can see that we are talking about two weekly services in each port and the, the, the ship is a little bit smaller. So one fits all doesn't uh, apply in our cases. We will be, uh, let's say, um, designing a class, a family of uh, vessels. Uh, finally, um, we would like to focus on this, uh, you know, sustainability approach. We are looking on safety. We want to be environmental uh, friendly. We want to be efficient in order to reach cost efficiency. And um, the problem addressed by Moses, uh, we do not think that has an obvious uh, solution. The expected benefits will strengthen, of course, the presence of social shipping within the EU uh, supply chain. Thank you very much. I tried to go as fast as uh, possible. You can see here where are the uh, various um, contact details of the project, uh, our uh, websites and uh, social media uh, details. And uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, you know, for inviting us uh, to this uh, Connecting EU Insights 2021, the spring edition, in order to present, to, to draft and to schedule this uh, session and uh, draft the specific presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I guess that uh, we have um, overpassed uh, our time for three minutes. So um, hopefully uh, we would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank uh, all the panelists for their interesting uh, presentations and the discussions and the replies to the various questions. I will go through, to, uh, through the last questions and I will try to uh, reply to them uh, as I see them on the Q&A on, on the chat. Thank you, Mercedes. Thank you, Sifis. Thank you, Ornolf. Thank you, Oderic. And of course, thank you, Alexio and uh, the Circle Group for inviting us uh, to this event. Thank you very much. <laughs>